Since it's December, I can break free from my handheld restraints, and instead of talking about a game you don't care about and can't easily buy, I'll talk about a game you don't care about, but you can easily buy, but you still won't. The Fallout series needs no introduction, but I'll give it one to pad out the video. Todd Howard invented the series in 2008, or at least that's all I knew of it when I was 14. The series is a lot of things, but to me personally, it is a trilogy that covers three games, each being a chapter in the rise of New California and its many inhabitants over the course of the centuries. And this series of events started right here, in 1997's Fallout, a post-nuclear role-playing game. And while I try not to spoil too much on the channel, I'm going to be going over the whole plot here, because I know the only people watching have either played the game, or never intend to. It's best to play Fallout from the point of view of someone with no preconceived expectations. Dive in fresh as these developers expected. But to start with, the instruction manual is wonderfully themed in-universe. It's a survival guide, and it tells us some basic history. We are an inhabitant of Vault 13, a public defense shelter made by the government contractor Vault Tech. As global tensions were rising, these were made to protect Americans from nuclear annihilation, and that's their only purpose. It was built during the 2060s, and was designed to be used for 10 years. By that point, people confined within its walls would leave and settle in what was left of the country. Because, you know, it would be silly if people lived in these bunkers for hundreds of years. Despite that, we are a vault dweller living in 2161, and were basically tasked by the man in charge of our vault to get a new water chip. This is a resource used to keep the steady supply of clean water in this underground bunker. The previous one has broken, likely because it wasn't meant to be used for this long. We are our vault's only hope, well except the last guy who died just outside. But wait, I got ahead of myself, we have to build our character. Look, there are lots of stats and ways to have unique builds. I won't go into all the depth here, but there are some things to be aware of. Our strength determines which weapons we can use. Our agility determines how many actions or how much movement we can do during combat turns. And if you have low intelligence, you are unable to speak properly, which locks you out of a lot of the game, and it makes this hard mode. We also have optional traits, which give us bonuses, but they have attached negatives. You never have to use them, but they're there to make the games in some ways easier, and in other ways more difficult. I love them. Also, before we even get to this, we would have been greeted by the iconic opening cinematic of Fallout, which shows us a television screen moments before the disaster, complete with United States soldiers gleefully executing people and waving to the camera. This isn't meant to be a cheerful and nostalgic period. It is a world on the brink of running out of resources. Also, we see remnants of the culture of the time, and it seems kind of like a 1950s style retrofuturism with the TVs and the car design, but also be aware that this world wasn't just the 1950s, but with energy weapons and big mech suits. It's a mysterious world we're not meant to know much about, outside small broken relics, and whatever written words have lasted this long. This wasn't just the 50s, the 1950s didn't have weird buildings with faces jutting out of them. But to get back onto the game part of the game, the cave that our vault called home is a really nice tutorial area. It's my favourite in the series. It teaches us how combat works. We move at the cost of action points, which are laid out on a HUD, and depending on what weapon we're using, or even its specific attack, the amount of AP will change. We have standard attacks, sometimes we get secondary ones like burst fire, and we can even aim for specific body parts, like the eyes, the groin, or boring places too. And if we end our turn with leftover AP, our armor class increases when the enemy retaliates. There is a bit of a learning curve here, but now that I'm used to it, it is one of my favorite combat systems in a game like this. 
even if people meme on it, because sometimes attacks miss, especially with low stats. Who could have guessed? I gotta say, I love the animations that sometimes occur after deaths. Bodies can sometimes rip apart after machine gun fire, or be electrocuted with energy weapons, or just have regular blood spurts. This is something that I feel only works with this kind of zoomed out perspective. It'd be weird if we see body parts break apart like they're made of tissue paper in first person 3D or something. Also in a nice touch, if your character's arm is crippled thanks to the enemies getting a good hit on you, you can't wield two handed weapons anymore. Both arms being like that means you can't wield any weapons. I know that's frustrating to some, but it just fuels my love of this game. And you can do that back to an enemy as well, if you want to aim for their arms instead of their groin. And if you want maximum combat enjoyment, and of course you do, make sure you turn up the animation speeds in the settings. There's other settings here to adjust to, because I don't have all day to slowly admire all the animation here, I'm too busy admiring the writing in the bottom left of the screen. Due to 1997 PC role-playing games not being able to balance visual fidelity and role-playing depth, the slack is picked up by descriptions that paint a much clearer picture than the graphics ever could. It helps fill in blanks, like I know this doesn't look blinding, but this would be the first time this person has ever seen sunlight in their entire lives. After exiting the cave, the world map makes its debut. And to me, this is perfection. There's no way they could render every bit of land here, because the scale of the map is ridiculous. They needed to show us the scope, while making sure the player couldn't actually get lost in it. It's a grid. We can go anywhere, and it takes a lot of time for our character to make these tricks, even if for us, the player, it's short. Random encounters can also pop up, which come in a few different flavors, there's regular encounters, sometimes with enemies, but other times you can get helpful NPCs. But there's also wacky, silly encounters, like a crashed alien ship, or a TARDIS, or a giant footprint, which unfortunately crushed someone who was invisible, thanks to the Stealth Boy item. And if traversing this land doesn't sound fun, then cool, you'll never have to aimlessly explore. We already start off with directions to a nearby vault, and while en route, we find a small town, and this town has a lot of NPCs who can give us directions to other towns, and so on. A little talking is all we need to do to know every location on the game's map. You shouldn't ever need to wander around blindly, but you still can. This opening town of Shady Sands is a wonderful introduction to this post-apocalyptic world. Instead of living in discarded junk of the past, this town has built its own buildings, developed its own agriculture, and has its own source of livestock. It is an uplifting picture of hope, and it shows that humanity is much more than its own destruction. Unfortunately, the one thing this town is lacking is muscle to get rid of the nearby giant scorpions, and one of her townspeople has been kidnapped by some raiders. But other than that, it is a nice introduction that shows that this world isn't without hope. But more importantly, it gives us our introduction to bartering, which genuinely feels like trading items here, instead of just selling everything and making a lot of money. Though it does suck later on when you're exchanging lots of money, because you can only do it in sets of 999 at a time. The currency of this land is bottle caps, it isn't super plentiful, especially this far up north. So exchanging items is usually what we have to settle for. At least until we get to the hub, and we can potentially infinite money glitch the game. Shady Sands even makes a kind introduction to low intelligence character builds. While most of the side quests are unavailable, or at the very least extremely limited to these characters, both of the main issues here in Shady Sands are available to these protagonists, though the companion Ian here isn't. Characters with higher intelligence, here's a sometimes invaluable addition, who also does unfortunately not have the best programming, and he has zero character depth. The companions were a very late introduction to the game during development, and they're not given the care they deserved, so think of them more as tools to ease battle 
than amazing traveling buddies that enrich in the world thanks to their great writing. That's what the sequels are for. Later on, we can also be joined by Taiko, Katja, and best of all, Dogmeat. The reason Dogmeat is a good boy is because he's the only one who doesn't shame low intelligence characters. He joins you even when no one else will. In Microcosm, this opening town shows us what to expect from the game as a whole. There are people in need, lots of characters to talk to who flesh out the world, sometimes even with voice acting, and we can make money and acquire resources quite easily. But to get back onto those faces, they give the first two fallouts a large part of their unmistakable identity. These were all made of clay, and then painstakingly digitized and turned into these beautiful creations, complete with lip syncing. It's a wonder we got as many as we did. Also the voice acting here, it's all great, especially for the standards of the time which were, well, not great. It says here to plug my next video. Anyway, the nearby vault is a bust and the townspeople here don't have their own water chip, so we're effortlessly forced to explore more of this world. Thankfully, since all the instructions were given us south, and this game starts us on the northernmost point of the map, it's a no-brainer to figure out where to go, even if you have zero instructions to go off. I mean, you can really only go south. What point is there of going west from Vault 13? Though some tension does start to arise now that we're free to explore, because our vault is running out of water, and this isn't an empty threat. If you don't progress the story, your vault will run out of water, and they will all die, and you'll get a game over. I know a lot of people won't like this on principle because time limits can be stressful to some, but I'll just say that in all my years of playing this game, including runs where I'm taking my time, or even my first playthrough where I didn't know what to expect, I've never come close to running out of a game's time limit. I basically had to force myself here just for the footage, and it was tedious. At the start, we have 150 days to save our vault. Time barely progresses when we're in towns, or any other screens of a game. In fact, I didn't even know time did pass until these recent playthroughs, where I got jump scared by a vault reminder, because it hit midnight. The main thing that costs time is exploring the map and going from town to town. It can be advantageous to actually waste time as well while you're on a map screen, and our pit boy does give us the ability to fast forward. It can be used for a few different reasons, one of which is to heal our health, which will slowly go up over time, or we can just wait for shops to open, since this is a real feeling world and people don't just stand at their shop for 24 hours a day waiting to trade. In fact, the dedication to realism even extends to having to holster our weapons when you're in a town. People don't take kindly to a newcomer running around with a gun or a spear. But to get back onto the topic, our pit boy will always tell us how many days we have left of this timer, and if you dawdle, the game will give you a message that water is running low. But don't panic, play this game by its own rules. It's an engrossing world that I keep coming back to, and it's not one where you want to spend an infinite amount of time in it. There's only so much you can do on a game this small anyway. If you want a game like this with zero time limits, I guess play Fallout 2 instead. Back to the story, down south from Shady Sands, we have Junk Town, which is a lot less idyllic of a town, but it also has shops, a bar, a casino, and a dog who can be your friend, so it's probably a place I'd rather live. Even the doctor here might harvest your organs to a guy who turns them into food, but places can't all be perfect. But despite this being a larger scale community, this town still finds a way to rope you into saving it, and this might be the best example of the game making you its saviour. You'll likely just go to a shop, because you like money and are carrying around a lot of sellables. But as soon as the transaction is done, someone comes into the shop to shoot the shopkeeper. Looks like you found yourself in the middle of a power struggle, and you can pick either side, or neither, and just leave. But if you aren't the kind of person who wants to shop and you're just exploring the town, there's another way to get you involved in all this. There is a building that has a cool rotating sign, and like a moth to light, you could just walk all the way over here and resolve the power struggle that way. 
God, I love this game. Surprisingly, the town made out of literal junk doesn't have a water chip, but there are two nearby locales that can help. The Hub and Necropolis are both places you could easily stumble on, and both of these can help solve your vault's main issue, at least for a while. Though the Hub is likely the one you'll come to first, and it gives you instructions to Necropolis. But sometimes when I'm just wandering blindly across the map, I guess I come to Necropolis first. I don't know why, I just do. And I need to stress, all of this is optional. There's nothing stopping you from starting the game and going to the final bosses, defeating them and calling it a day. I mean, the difficulty of a game will probably stop you, but it is possible. But this is one of those games where it's in your best interest to take your time somewhat. And what I'm explaining is just the intended order. Though there's nothing stopping you from doing this all out of order. Like you could finally go to Shady Sands after you already have power, armor, and a group of companions. It's possible. In fact, over my three complete playthroughs I did for this video, I did just that on one of them by starting the game blindly and going all the way to the hub, and then after a while backtracking all the way back to the start. In this region of the American Wastes, the hub is the biggest home of commerce. We have a casino that's easy to abuse, many shops, caravans that take supplies to other communities, and best of all, we have Harold. I'm cranky old and I've been that way ever since I changed. He's a mutant who is decidedly not super, but he's one of the most important characters in the series. We'll even see him in other games too since he doesn't like being rooted in one place. The caravans serve multiple purposes for players. We can join them as guards, which not only gives us caps, but it can also show us other locations on the map, even for new players who don't know this wasteland's locales. But more importantly, these caravans can help with the big obvious timer. We can exchange a caravan to deliver water straight to Vault 13. It won't end the water crisis, but it will delay it by another 100 days. You see, the hub serves as a source of clean water for a lot of the map. The reason caps are even a currency here at all is because they're used to bottle the water. It makes logical sense and isn't just a cute little thing because it's post-apocalyptic. These caps are sometimes called hub script due to their ties to this one specific area. For players familiar with later games, you'd know that in Fallout 2 you can stumble upon a load of caps and the player ignores them because they're just worthless trash. Because this wouldn't be a long-term currency everywhere. It's just an invaluable resource in this one specific area at this one specific time thanks to trade routes coming from a town that delivers water from its immense supply. No one would use caps as a currency after more traditional money is reintroduced. Except for on the East Coast, and for some reason Nevada. Oh well. But who cares about silly little things like water or how the world supports itself? We have Harold. I know I already mentioned him, but he's a king. Unfortunately, the hub isn't all great. For some reason, underneath all the drinking and gambling is a seedy underbelly. There are gangs, thieves, cops, and worst of all, Harold racism. Don't be mean to him. Not everywhere in this world can be a shady sands. The world here is struggling thanks to the same kinds of power dynamics and control of resources that almost entered the world earlier. War never changes. That's what it means, it's not just a cool tagline. Humanity can do so much to be self-sustaining and to genuinely want to help people, but that doesn't matter because some people who control everything can make things worse for everyone around them. And this is the part of the video where someone complains I'm bringing up politics into something as apolitical as Fallout. But at least this vice-filled hub of the, uh, the hub has drugs which are a great way to temporarily boost your character stats, with the horrible downside of becoming addicted, which among other things can make it so you die if you have low health when withdrawal kicks in. I only bring that up because it killed me at the end of the game once. Be more careful. But drugs do have positives too, like allowing low intelligence characters to temporarily get enough intelligence to shop at the ableist stores that don't like a guy who grunts and doesn't speak. And things get even more bleak 
when we see of a nearby necropolis. It's a town populated by ghouls. They're basically people who have been rotting away thanks to the effects of radiation. And while they live long, centuries long lives, their bodies are deteriorating and the game isn't shy to describe the unpleasantries. Though more often than not, their minds remain healthy and they're some of the most interesting characters in the series lore. Though here, in this first game, we don't really get too much of a chance for them to shine. This is more of a collective group with a few notable outliers. But what it lacks in single character depth, it more than makes up for in story significance and player choice. Necropolis was once known as Bakersfield, and while the above ground legacy has deteriorated, as has the underground, this was once home to a vault. And while most of it has been left to rot, the water chip here is still functioning. And that's the reason the ghouls live here. There is enough water for all of them, since ghouls obviously need water and couldn't just stay alive for hundreds of years without it. And this is it. You're not going to find another water chip for your vault. You have to get the one from Necropolis. But you'd be dooming the entire populace if you just took it. Though there is another solution to keep the ghouls happy and to save your vault. But regardless of how you go about it, your mission is done. Well, it would be. Because you see, while you're here, you discover some super mutants and their army. We learn more about their ideology and their creation later. But that's not a problem. We saved our vault. Oh, but unfortunately, going back home isn't the end of this. Because thanks to our character's reports, the overseer of our vault is now aware that super mutants exist and he won't feel safe until they're dealt with too. And just like that, the game has effortlessly put us into a wider conflict, much like how shopping put us in the middle of Junktown's power struggle. Here, saving our vault was really just the beginning. And in a really nice touch, a second invisible timer has begun, or it would have on original copies, because it was subsequently patched out of the game. There are mods to bring it back to the game, which I heavily recommend using. 500 days after saving your vault, the super mutants will find it and destroy it. But you could have inadvertently screwed yourself over earlier, because if you had the hub deliver water back to Vault 13, that 500 day timer shrinks to 400 days. It is one of the game's best gut punches. Your intended solution just gave up the anonymity of the vault, and it may have doomed them all. This added layer of depth being removed in patches kind of ruins it for me. Now telling people where your vault is had zero consequences. Also, if your vault is found, or if you straight up tell the mutants where it is, there's a beautiful computer animated cutscene that plays, and the game has quite a few of these. Now larger computer resolutions have not been kind to these, nor has time in general. But this was a huge amount of effort for this small 1997 game to do. And it's important to note that while I'm explaining this game in quite a bit of detail, this is a quick RPG you can easily beat in a weekend, or way less time if you're attempting to be fast and skip a lot of things. This is a bite-sized RPG, and that's why I love it. There isn't much here besides a few small towns, and the general loop of the game is always the same each time. But god is it engrossing. You may have already noticed the game's strong art direction, but the music is on a whole other level. The tracks from the first two fallouts have been playing throughout this video, and they're masterful scores that really immerse you in this world, especially the first games. They're melancholic, atmospheric pieces that feel industrial and, uh, I don't know. I'm not good at describing music, I'm not really a music kind of person. Let's just say the music is great. And without ragging too much on other games, or the fandom at large, it does sadden me that this isn't the game's musical identity. Most people think of the music of Fallout as licensed music from the early to mid 20th century, and that does sadden me. These pieces deserve to be remembered. And before talking about the climax of the game, I'll take another detour to talk about some other people who live underground and care a lot about the old world. There's this group called the Brotherhood of Steel, and in this game, 
They are the most powerful humans around. They're hoarding old weapons and military power armor, which are these beautiful chunky metal suits. This group is rich with characters who have a lot of meaningful things to say. And more importantly, we get more talking heads here complete with voice acting to bring this group alive. But there are also exclusionist jerks who don't care a lot about outsiders, and I'm glad they became irrelevant in Fallout 2. Too bad no other Fallout devs seem to have gotten the memo. But if you want to gain entrance to their bunker and get the cool power armor, and I guess learn more about the world and make more allies and other things like that, you have to go on a suicide mission that you will easily die on if you're not prepared, and the corpse of someone else who attempted this is your introduction. Welcome to the GLOW. Short explanation, this was a research facility. It was hit by a nuclear strike. It is hell and it glows at night. But if you can go here and grab some evidence, the Brotherhood will tolerate your existence. And it may not seem like it, but this is also one of the most important areas in the entire Fallout series. An area less important, but still up there for what it introduces, is the Boneyard. It goes by a few other names as well, but in our world, we know it as Los Angeles. It's the last of the settlements we can trade in and get a bunch of quests in, but it brings us some important faces. We have the helpful followers of the Apocalypse, who are one of the kindest groups in post-nuclear America. And this same city also has Death Claws. They are not a kind face. They're a kind of late game threat to make players suffer, but they also make you feel immense joy and satisfaction for besting them all. Then the game immediately humbles you, because once you see the super mutants for Death Claws seem easy. There are two other locales that we need to explore and vanquish the threats of. And these can be done in either order. These are where the super mutants are created, and where their leader resigns. This is the master. He can't be reasoned with. He dislikes humans, and is confident his plan of super mutants running the world is the only logical choice. And unlike any other villain in the series, he is a threat beyond just a big strong guy to defeat. He knows humanity is flawed. They led to the planet's near destruction after all. Are best equipped to deal with the world today. Who else? The ghouls? Please. Normals! They brought nuclear death to us all. This will be the age of mutants. Mutants. And in a lot of ways, the super mutants are more fit to live in a world that is this hazardous and at times very radioactive. The master is dedicated to his cause, and while it's horrible, there is almost a logic to it. He isn't just evil for the sake of evil, nor is he just another way of saying fascism is bad actually, like the sequels will explore. The master and his beautifully haunting voices can't be talked out of this by a charming vault dweller. He either has to be killed, or be given demonstrable evidence of how his plans are not good long term by one of his own loyal mutants. But it cannot be. This would mean that all my work has been for nothing. Everything that I've tried to a, a failure. It can't be. 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 And with that, we get a cool sequence where we run out of the building right before an explosion. In fact, we get two of these because the military base where the mutants are physically created also has one. Whichever you end on, it's a satisfying conclusion. And that's Fallout one of the greatest games to ever exist. I know that's a jarring transition, but so is the game just cutting from an explosion to talking to a dude in a cave. But quickly on this, the ending here is perfection. But I actually lied slightly, there is something that happens between the explosion and the talk in the cave, and it's one of the best things the Fallout series ever brought to the table. We get a slideshow explaining what happened to all the settlements and factions, after our story has concluded. There's quite a bit of variety here since there's a lot you could have done, and in some places can be better off or worse off, all based on our actions. It's a sense of closure that makes it feel like we had a real impact on this world, even if it can't physically be represented in the game. Anyway, back to wrapping things up. I play this first Fallout every year or two, and I never tire of it. Like sure, it is a short game, 
and it is lacking the amount of freedom of its sequels, but this is a cozy game to relax with. Later fallouts get bigger and more complicated, but I feel none of them have the strong atmosphere and consistently high writing of this first game, because this is all so tightly focused. There is a lot less that could go wrong here, and would sometimes see that in the bigger sequels, even the ones I adore. But I get a bit sad of the legacy of this game. It's often treated as a nice game to read about on a wiki, or watch a video about, but people don't often want to play it, or see the game's depth firsthand. This is more than the great start of a hugely successful mainstream game series. This is an excellent work of art that would stand strong even if it had no follow-ups to build off its foundation. And I'm hoping to build off my current foundation thanks to my Patreon supporters, some of whom saw this video early, and on this one occasion, or whenever else I feel like it, were able to help me decide which game to do a video on next. So thanks to Democracy, we're going from a 1997 game that everyone calls dated even though I disagree, to a 1996 game that everyone calls dated even though I disagree. Resident Evil 1, but specifically the version for Nintendo DS that most people didn't play, and whenever it's mentioned they respond with, wait what, there was a Resident Evil port on DS? Yeah, they did a Resident Evil port on DS, and it is my favourite version of this game, which probably surprised no one. 